Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the College of Continuing and Professional Studies webinar, Teamwork, Small Acts, Big Wins. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Next slide, please. It's a pleasure to have you all here this afternoon. My name is Lisa Beckham, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. If you have future questions about this webinar or other programs that we offer, my contact information will be on the last slide of this presentation. Next slide, please. There are some logistical items I'd like to address before we begin. I ask that you please submit your questions throughout the webinar so we can address them during the Q&A portion of this presentation, which will be the last five minutes of this webinar. To submit your questions, go to the description on the bottom of the YouTube video and click on the link to the question form. Live captioning is also available as a link in the YouTube description box. To view live captioning, click the stream text link in the YouTube description box. Next slide, please. We will send an email within a week with the link to the recording of this webinar. The link will be sent to the email address you submitted during registration. I am absolutely honored to introduce the topic for today's webinar, Teamwork, Small Acts, Big Wins. Resilient teams are just as important to businesses as resilient individuals. Especially today, we need teams that can overcome the challenges of these unusual times. A critical foundation component of resilient teams is a climate in which team members feel comfortable expressing and being themselves. Also called psychological safety, it's one of the characteristics that most high performing teams have in common. So how do you build and maintain psychological safety? You may be surprised to, at how a small few small changes can positively impact your team in significant ways. During this webinar, you will examine what psychological safety is and why it's important, ways to make it safe for team members to be themselves, and useful tips to express emotions without getting emotional. It's an honor to introduce the presenter for today's webinar, Nan Gesh. Nan has over 20 years experience rooting out where things go wrong and helping them go right. As an educator, speaker, and coach whose passion is to help people play well together, Nan guides organizations and individuals through transition without losing sight of their strategic goals. Nan works with diverse organizations and individuals on projects such as change management, conflict management, and resiliency building. It's an absolute pleasure to have Nan with us here today. Welcome, Nan, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate the introduction and welcome everyone. It's a beautiful day out there, at least in Minnesota. So I'm glad you've taken the time to join us. I appreciate it. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Like how many of you have ever been in a meeting with your team and it's supposedly a board meeting, but you're truly bored? And it might be because of how the meeting and the team functions. And I use this visual because it was early in my career, I was working for an individual who ran a district and I was running the training and organizational development function. And it was my first time sitting in a senior management meeting. And what was interesting is imagine in the picture that I have up that the person actually running the meeting is by the whiteboard or the screen in the back of this picture. So basically no one at the meeting is looking at the person who is running the meeting. You know, and I'm sitting in the back of the room, they're all looking at me with these faces and I'm like, ooh, this is not good. This is a sign that this is a team that's struggling on some level. And part of it was these weren't really management and team meetings. These were status meetings, status, 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 no debate, no dialogue, no discussion. That also means there was no engagement of anybody in the room um, because nobody was asking them any questions. And when they were asked a question, they would turn their chair and look at the individual and they would respond. And then they would turn their chair back to the room, back towards the back of the room. And this kind of sparked an interest in me that, hmm, 
I don't know what was wrong and what the terminology for what was going on, but it was clear to me this was not a good situation. And I discovered later this is what psychological safety isn't. And that's kind of the perfect example. Why do we care about this? Well, Gallup has said that, you know, teams that where the members are engaged are 23% more profitable. Unfortunately, about 58% of most employees admit they are disengaged. You know, when you think about it, we work 90,000 hours in our life. That's 10 hours nonstop, 24 seven, you know, and wouldn't it be nice if when we went to work, we felt comfortable, included, accepted, respected, valued, it wouldn't feel so stressful. And then, you know, we could be who we were and then ultimately more productive and we'd have less turnover. So it all makes sense, but intellectually we know this, but why doesn't it always happen? And part of that is we don't fully understand what psychological safety is. You know, I've got a list here of what psychological safety is. And this list was developed by a lot of research done by Google. In 2012, Google wanted to figure out what made great teams. Why were some of their teams so much better than other teams? And what they found out that it wasn't the team members' tenure, experience, you know, their seniority. It didn't have anything to do whether they were an introvert or an extrovert. It didn't have a lot to do whether they were experts. It had more to do with how the team interacted. And they learned that what they had to focus on was creating an environment where it was safe to talk about anything. You know, think about it. In your life, we all have individuals, whether it's your partners, your siblings, you know, that close friend that you can tell them any, anything and you don't have to be fearful of being judged or criticized. And that's what psychological safety is, is finding that moment of where we can talk about the undiscussables. We can point out problems without feeling as if the other person is going to attack us or conversation is going to be come to a screeching halt or there's going to be repercussions to our job. What we don't always understand, though, is what psychological safety isn't. And psychological safety isn't the freedom from conflict. You know, we can't openly disagree with each other and not expect there's going to be some conflict. It's learning how to manage that conflict. And that's a whole nother course a full day course to figure out how to do that effectively. And it's not always about being nice. It's about being honest. It is learning how to be honest in a respectful manner. It also isn't getting what you want. It's putting what you want in your perspective on the table, but that's going to be challenged by other people at the table. As a result, people are gonna be uncomfortable sometimes. Psychological safety also doesn't give anybody the right just to whine and complain because that doesn't help the group or the team move forward. You're just venting and we'll talk about this when we get to the emotional piece. The, the reality is our goal isn't to create psychological safety for the sake of psychological safety. It's to get back to that higher performance I met, mentioned at the beginning. You know, don't you want to have higher profitability, have more engaged employees? I mean, who wouldn't? So one of the first things we need to do in order to create a psychologically safe environment is what's called conversational turn-taking. And what that means is that everyone gets a chance to speak, okay? Last night, my book club got together and it was interesting because we don't meet where not everyone isn't asked a question or asked to give input on the book, even if they didn't read the book. Because we'll even ask someone, well, what's your thought? What's your perspective? You know, based on what you've heard us talk about, do you really want to finish the book? What often happens in most group meetings and most team interactions is that 80% of the conversation is dominated by 20% of the participants. We've lost 80% of the ideas, 80% of the voices. <clears throat> you know, we don't hire bright, motivated, intelligent people to treat them as if they were dumb and uh, dim and unmotivated. So why aren't we including them in the conversation? You know, our job is to figure out how to engage that other 80%. And yes, there is a difference between introverts and extroverts, but if you create the right environment, you can figure out how to engage that other 80%, even if they are introverts. 
And so we have to take turns. We have to make sure that everyone at the table, in the room, in the Zoom meeting, has an opportunity to give their turn, have their turn and give their perspective. And one of the best ways to do this is to set this expectation, but it's to ask questions of those who are quiet and make sure that just because you're not an expert doesn't mean you don't get to talk. Like I said, even in my book club, even if somebody didn't read the book, we still ask for their input and their participation. Part of being in the meeting, you can pick up on the interactions and the information that people are talking about that even if you're not an expert, you may pick up on something because you've got fresh eyes, a fresh lens. So conversational turn-taking means giving everyone a chance. And then it's also showing interest when they do take the time to give their perspectives and share their ideas. Now, it's interesting if anybody's a Saturday Night Live fan that uh, Lauren Michael, he straight up said voice at the table is together. And so he sets the, pers- uh, the expectation that everyone in up, you know, some of you, if you're introvert, please, I don't want to, but there are ways to figure out how to engage people differently that it makes them more comforting that you're going to have to say something, you've had a chance to think about it before you get there, especially if the team has sent out an agenda for that first meeting or those those team meetings. So set that expectation that everyone will participate. Everyone has a voice and he forces everyone to speak up. And he also expects... Now, I say that there's one exception is if that 20%, 80% of the floor occasionally somebody is going to have to interrupt and interject to make sure that that other 80% gets heard. So maybe it's you just speaking up for yourself. Maybe it's somebody else in the room saying, hmm, anybody else notice that we've only heard from a third of the room? I'd like to hear some other perspectives. Use technology and structured processes. When I work with groups, one of the things I, you know, I teach a course on problem solving and decision making, and I try and teach them how to use technology and structured processes to make sure that even the introverts feel safe talking. You know, so we'll do things like, you know, brainstorming on post-it. So everyone has to come up with, you know, three ideas on a post-it, and then we'll put them on the wall and cluster them. So there are structured processes that you can use, all kinds of things with jam boards and things like that. Um, whether you're using Zoom or Google, there's all kinds of technology now. Use a facilitator. If you don't have access to the facilitator, maybe just point to somebody in the group for every meeting or every time the group has a meeting and make sure that they're paying attention to see if everyone's had a chance to go come to the table and speak. The other thing is just gradually open the conversation. You may have heard of the think, pair, share you know, brainstorm, think about it individually, pair up with somebody else in the room. And even if you're not in a meeting, you know, somebody sends out, we're going to have a meeting at the end of the week about X, Y, Z, tell people to partner up, okay, and share their perspectives together and think together for a few minutes before you actually have the meeting, because it feels safer to interact maybe with one other person. If you don't have that luxury, sometimes I do the one, two, four, eight in a group meeting, individually brainstorm, pair up, and then go to groups of four. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that a lot of times people are like, well, we don't have time for everyone to talk at a meeting. And what's happened is we've become so focused on efficiency that we've lost effectiveness in our teams because the effectiveness comes really from getting the ideas and the perspectives from everyone in the room. So, Oftentimes, we have to just ask questions, okay? A lot of times people will say the most intelligent person in the room isn't the one who has all the answers. It's the one who asks the best questions, especially of those individuals we haven't heard from yet. You know, research has proven that people are two times more likely to participate if we just ask them. So keep a bunch of, you know, questions in your back pocket. You know, when you're just going into a meeting, do you have some standard questions that you can always ask? Or when you stop by somebody's cube or when you're in a Zoom meeting and you know someone's not participating, you know, what would it like look like from your perspective? If it was up to you, how would you remedy this situation? Okay. Think of four or five questions that you can kind of have in your back pocket at all times. 
And part of it is just getting to know individuals as well. So do you even have questions on how to get to know people on your team? You know, tell me about X, Y, Z, whether it's a picture or a trophy, even in the Zoom meeting, you probably see something in their background that you don't know something about. And so spend some time at those meetings, Zoom meetings, socializing and asking about people's backgrounds. What I've basically found is that the fewer questions that are asked, the more bad ideas tend to live on within a group. Okay. Um, and I just like this video, this visual, because it, it makes me laugh. But what happens is when people aren't asking questions, what I find is there's the meeting after the meeting. Okay. Everyone leaves the meeting and somebody said, oh yeah, we reached consensus and this is great. Maybe 20 to 30% of the people talked and the meeting after the meeting is when people are like, yeah, that'll never work. Okay. What were we thinking? Well, it's because we weren't getting everyone's voices. We wouldn't have to have the meeting after the meeting if people could speak up and felt safe speaking up in the meetings. Now, if we're going to ask questions, we need to actually listen. Okay. So no one's really asking if no one's listening. And I think the perfect example of this is how many times in the morning, you know, especially when you're in an office environment, you walk by one of your coworkers and it's like, how you doing? And then you just keep walking. You don't actually stop to have a conversation. You ask, but you have no intentions of listening. Okay. It's just a greeting. And when we ask questions, we really have to be in that mind space that we're open to hearing what they have to say, okay? That we want to stop and actually look at them and listen to what they're saying. And the looking is to watch for the nonverbals. It's also to show respect. We learned when we were in grade school that we needed to paraphrase content. You know, what I heard you say, if I understood you correctly, you know, you may have learned that try and repeat the last three to five words in the last couple of sentences that the person who did just speak said, okay, that's paraphrasing content. Most of us are pretty good at that, but we maybe never learned to paraphrase feelings, which is paying attention to what the other person is expressing. And we'll speak to this when I get to the emotional component, but we have to pay attention to the nonverbals and the tone of people's voice to pick up on their feelings and always just ask more questions, okay, if we want to engage other members. So besides the conversational turn-taking, we need to figure out how to encourage more social interaction, okay? If you know the people you work with, you tend to be more supportive of those individuals. You feel safer disagreeing with them. I mean, when you think about the people that you feel safe saying anything to, part of it is because you have a long history, you have a shared understanding. It's the same thing at work. It's the same thing in any professional association where you have teams. You have to get to know each other as people and build internal connections. It doesn't mean that you have to be best friends and want to spend your weekends with the individuals. It does, need, it does mean you have to know something about them and that you respect them as individuals for who they are and what they bring to the table. So how do we do this? Well, the best companies to work for have started to understand that we have to designate social space. You know, is there a place where people can gather to have lunch? Is there a break room? Is there a place to play ping pong? Are there vending machines? You know, it used to be a lot of times it was the coffee, you know, where, where the coffee is or where the lunch, where the refrigerator is or where the photocopier is. You know, there were spaces that people would just congregate, but we have to be more mindful and actually create social space. And we have to create time to discuss non-work issues. I mean, the reality is hardly anybody is productive every hour of their, you know, working day. We spend times doing personal things and we spend some time socializing. And we don't want to take away that socializing time because that's how we get to know each other. We get to build, you know, connections, personal connections with each other. And put networking on your calendar. You know, this is, you have to make an effort to get to know your team members, whether it's I'm going to have coffee or go for a walk with somebody on my team, try and do something once a week. Now, this is work. It's called networking for a reason. Just like it's called teamwork, it takes work. 
just like you have to pay attention to the projects and the processes that you're working on, you have to put effort into building the relationships with the individuals on your team. Okay. And we have to, especially nowadays, this whole COVID thing, groups really struggle. Like I teach full-time at the University of Minnesota and I teach a class called Small Group Communications. And I actually had to assign my students a couple of activities where all they had to do was socialize because they would get together and they would start working. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to have some personal interaction. And it was so funny because I would, you know, like you have to have a 45 minute assignment where all you have to do is socialize, play cards against humanity, you know, whatever game you want to play, you know, two truths and a lie. And the responses I get were like, wow, that was so useful. It was so nice to get to know my team members. I really look at them differently that we have to make a concerted effort. And it's, it really is a concerted effort when you're working virtually because we just jump on our Zoom meetings and we just start going into the interaction of the meeting. And it is that status, status, status versus having good dialogue. And part of that is making time at the beginning or the end or allowing a little bit of the space for some socializing. As I said, one of the simple things you can do is just notice one thing in everyone's you know, background and ask them a question about their background, because then you get to know more about them. It's also celebrating. You know, a lot of times, especially when there's budget cuts, one of the first things people do is we cut out money to celebrate birthdays. We cut out anniversaries. We cut out, you know, bringing donuts or bringing in lunch, different things like that. I get that. But there are still ways that you can celebrate and acknowledge people's contribution to the team. And I think it's important for people to be treated and acknowledged as individuals, not just as a team member. You know, when I worked for the government, when we celebrated birthdays, everyone would pitch in a dollar and then we'd go get uh, lottery cards, you know, lottery tickets and scratch them off. And we're all like, oh, if you win big, take us with you, you know. Um, and a lot of times it was five minutes. It was a dollar. You know, we only had what we only had like 14 people on our team. So it was $14 that we spent every year and it didn't take that much time to do it, but it was kind of a fun thing to do to build a connection. And I would tell you that your conversations, I learned this from a salesperson one time, every conversation should start with relationship building, relationship, task, relationship. You know, again, you don't have to become best friends, but it's just acknowledging, you know, hey, you know, what did you do last weekend? Or if you know something about your team members, follow up. How was that event you had? You know, I heard your kid was, you know, ask him about it. And now organizations are, you know, structuring what they call employee resource groups, ERGs. Some of your organization may have those. It's just a structured process to create socialization. The third thing to do these small acts for big wins is to demonstrate some high social sensitivity, okay, or empathy, and know that there's a difference between empathy and sympathy, okay? But this gets back to that paraphrasing content, paraphrasing feelings. Do you notice when your team member's mood shifts? Okay, do you know how they typically, you know, show up every day? Do you pay attention when you notice some difference in their level of interaction, whether it is coming to the break room, joining the Zoom meetings, putting their video on, they used to put it on, now they don't. Do you notice it? And so that's part of what high social sensitivity is, is that you pick up on people's feelings and reactions. Okay? You notice that there is a difference. And we do this in our personal lives. When we see our friends and family members, you know, we provide social support. We notice what their stress triggers are. And sometimes we brainstorm with them, you know, to come up with ways to deal with them. That's second nature to us. But do we do that with our team members? Okay. Not, not as much, not as much many times. And I think it's interesting is that um, with that is we also then have to think about how do we actually show empathy? But to go back to that high social sensitivity, you know, the minister at my church, John Ross, one of the things he'll often say is that his job as a leader is to manage change at the rate his team members can handle it. 
And the only way he knows that is to know each of them as an individual and their capacity to deal with stress and change and to pay attention to their responses when he talks about change. And we have to pay attention to the individual, to look at them, to watch how cues and tone and nonverbal shift. And we also have to know, as I said, the difference between empathy and sympathy, which I'll talk about in a minute. But if you want to build more empathy, we have to put some effort into it. You know, a lot of times when our teams are interacting, most of the attention goes to the person with the loudest voice. You know, what about if we paid more attention to the person with the kindest voice? Okay. Because a lot of times what we focus on in our meetings gets bigger. So is it okay for somebody to be disrespectful to their team members because they're a good salesperson? Or do we appreciate the individuals who make sure that everyone at the table gets a chance to be part of the conversation? And what I'll tell you is part of building empathy means starting with yourself. You know, it's starting with self-compassion. If the people that you work with, your team members, see you really being hard on yourself and you're judging yourself harshly, what do you think they're going to think is going to happen to them? Okay. When they do something wrong or they ask a question that, you know, they may think is too basic, that if we demonstrate some self-compassion for ourselves, we tend to make it safer for other people because they know what your response is, and it's going to be accepting that, hey, we're all human. In fact, one of the things you can do to build psychological safety is to talk about your mistakes. You know, sometimes when I work with groups, I'll, you know, just ask the question, when was the last time your supervisor talked about a mistake they made? Well, if your supervisor's not talking about a mistake they made, do you think the employees are? Somebody in your team has to have the courage to talk about a mistake that they've made, you know, and part of it is creating a mindset that, you know, a mistake is a trial and error, or is it trial and learn? Because what did we learn? I don't know about you, but I always learn more from any mistake I've made than anything I have done right. And it's being vulnerable to share that with other people. Okay. And I mentioned this before, noticing people's emotions and asking questions, following up, you know, research has proven that kindness, just like any other emotion, can be contagious. You know, and when we see other people asking questions and encouraging others, you know, and pointing out that they've, you know, asked for the participation and engagement of others, other people will start to replicate that type of behavior. Okay. And when we use technology, again, I talked about that. It's not just click and comment. Make sure you're doing that relationship task relationship. Spend a little time building the relationship and practice empathy. You know, I mean, praise empathy in others. Even if you can't do it, notice when somebody else is and celebrate the messenger. Let everyone else on the team know that you appreciate it, whether it's to you. You know, if someone shows you some empathy, you know, thank you for noticing. Thank you for asking. But if it's towards somebody else, also speak up, you know, wow, that was really, that was great. You took the time. You could see that something had changed. Asking that question really drew them into the meeting. Some of you may have seen this, but um, I love this video. It's Brene Brown. And I'm only going to, I'm going to show the video, but do know that some of this speaks to emotional intelligence, which was last month's um, webinar. It also is going to speak to perspective taking, which is next month's session. So I'm only going to touch on this very briefly, but I do think this is a great video. So we are going to go ahead and watch this. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. 
Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. (laughs) Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling rarely if ever does an empathic response begin with at least I had a yeah and we do it all the time because you know what someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. (laughs) John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Yeah, so I love that video from Brene Brown. Um, and she's got a lot of great work on vulnerability and leadership. She's very popular. She's got a podcast out there now. What the difference between empathy and sympathy is at work. A lot of times we don't think we can show empathy, you know, and the reality is we need to speak human to human. It, it isn't like when we come to work every day, we get to check our emotions at the door. I mean, I remember when I played basketball in high school, the coach used to say that, Nan, check your personal life on the, at the door before you hit the court. And humans aren't that way. It's not that easy. You know, we all have a universal need to be respected and competent, you know, for some level of autonomy but we all think differently. You know, one of the things I'll say when I'm working with a group sometimes is if people aren't openly disagreeing with each other during the meeting, that tells me that there isn't psychological safety. And if everyone's thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking because we all have different perspectives and backgrounds and experiences And we have to figure out how to create that space. And that's what Google was trying to figure out. How do we create that space? And it's some of the things I've talked about. It's that turn taking, you know, it's making sure that they do build that social space into their work environment. It's teaching people the difference between sympathy and empathy. But the perspective taking, as I said, you know, just consider this. We all have deep needs to be trusted and appreciated. And you're going to get a whole lot more of this next month, like I said, because the whole session, I think, is primarily on perspective taking. Number four, those small acts to the big wins, is learning how to use feedback effectively on your teams. You know, what I find is really people don't like to give feedback very often. You know, as soon as somebody comes and taps you on the shoulder and it's like, Ooh, Nan, I've got some feedback for you. It's like, Oh, now what did I do wrong? You know, I, I said this once at a seminar that I did and someone's commented, if somebody tells you they have feedback for you, they're like, what happens? And they're like, Oh, I get sweaty. And I asked, why do you get sweaty? And they're like, Oh, something bad's going to happen. You know, we always make the assumption or we make the assumption a lot of times that feedback is going to be something bad. And it doesn't have to be. This is our choice. But feedback is such a, you know, it's one of the most powerful tools that a team has, and they don't leverage it as effectively as they could. You know, 43% of the most gay engaged employees receive feedback at least once a week. Okay. Now, that's just in a supervisory perspective, but just think about peer to peer. 
you know, why is it that we often think that the feedback just has to come from the supervisor or the team lead? What's keeping the team members from talking about what they appreciate about what you're doing or what they need from you to help the team to be different? You know, what do I need as an individual? It's really helpful when you, okay, that helps me think differently. Okay. And so it's thinking about the feedback, but when it comes to feedback, to create psychological safety, start with yourself. You know, go around and ask people, how, how did I contribute on that last project? You know, when I gave you feedback, how did that come across? If you had to rate me on a scale of one to 10, where would you put me? What could I do differently to get to be a 10? Now, we, if we can ask for feedback and respond respectfully, it starts to create that psychological safety of valuing feedback. So it's important to start asking for feedback yourself sometimes before you even start giving people feedback. Okay? Giving in a people effective feedback, intellectually we know it, we just don't actually do it very effectively. When you think about it, we've all known the feeling that you have an idea that you wanna share in the meeting, and in front of all your coworkers and your boss, you share your plan, your idea, your perspective into your horror. Somebody in the room says, yeah, no, I don't think that'll work. Or there's that deafening silence in the group meeting and you look across the table and somebody's rolling their eyes. Okay. We have to know how to give feedback. Okay. We need to do it more often, but we need to learn how to do it. You know, at this point, your face is burning and you wish you could disappear into thin air. And that's why I have this visual because it's like, please let this just be over. And I love the book, No Hard Feelings by Liz and Molly. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list, but it's an easy read and it's a, it's a great reference point. But they talk about criticism crime scenes. And basically what it says is that we need to work on our delivery. That a lot of times when we go into meetings, we only point out what's wrong. We don't do it at, you know, we do it in the front of a lot of other people versus talking to the individual one-on-one. -on -one. We're overly blunt. And, you know, this is, a, some of these are hard for me. <laughs> you know, I don't have many filters and I can be a little direct. I often say that, you know, I teach what I teach because I'm hoping one day I'll get better at it. So I started to laugh when I saw this criticism crime scene because it's, yep, yep, been guilty of that sometimes. But what I try and work with and teach others is to use what I call the PPG model. When we're giving people feedback, start with praise. You know, thanks for taking the risk of sharing that idea. The second P is possibility. Think about how you might be able to use that idea. If not now, maybe later. And then and only then do you maybe talk about what's wrong. Because we need to think about how to give some positive reinforcement more often if we want people to participate. And one of the things that will make a difference is from a process perspective. When you're in a group and you're brainstorming, brainstorm and then evaluate. Because nothing shuts down psychological safety and people's contribution faster than somebody evaluating and criticizing an idea right during the brainstorming process. Now, one of the things I say is that it's really helpful to give more positive reinforcement. You know, research has proven it takes five forms of appreciation to counteract every form of criticism. I actually don't like that terminology. I prefer, you know, um, redirecting behavior versus criticism. Uh, because a lot of times, as I said, it's not that you're criticizing the person, you need them to do something differently, though, to be effective to work with them. It's not that they're bad. There's something wrong with them. It's this is what you need to be more effective when you're working with the individual. But challenge yourself to give more positive reinforcement. You know, give credit where credit is due, create positive feelings. When we have positive feelings, it tends to reduce anxiety and people are more likely to participate. And so I've often tell individuals when I'm coaching them, get five pennies, put them in your work area, whether it's your desk or even working remotely. At the end of the day, have you given five forms of positive or reinforcing feedback during the day versus how many times have you criticized someone? 
And so think about how do I up my game on that reinforcing? And it can be things, you know, I've got simple starters here. I know, you know, you're really strong because I appreciate that you did this. I felt understood when I noticed X, Y, Z. And so using these types of statements, but challenge yourself. And for some people, you know, maybe doing one form of reinforcement every day is a great place to start. And you have to work up to five. But a lot of times we only give feedback when somebody does something wrong. And when we do that after a while, I don't know about you, but I stop listening to those individuals. Okay. Some of you, if you've ever taken any of my courses, I may talk about this, but if the only thing you hear after a while, you get that la, 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 you don't even listen anymore because you know, all they're going to say is something that you've done wrong. And it's our natural inclination for some of us to only point out what is wrong, but we also have to point out what is right to the individual so that they will keep doing it. It's also so they feel safe and respected in the group so that we can continue to get their participation. The other part of this is, you know, we want to go into it with a mindset of curiosity. And we're going to speak to this with the emotions. We want to become curious, not furious. Okay, we don't want to blame somebody for something that's gone wrong because sometimes we have to talk about where things went wrong, but we have to have an open mind. You know, as I said before, rarely does anybody come to work hoping to screw up, make somebody look bad, and to sab sabotage their team. You know, we have different perspectives and we have to figure out how to value them. And as I said, it's with curiosity and asking questions. Elaine Fisher, you know, she's a, a famous clothing designer. She talks about being a, I don't know her. Okay. Um, it's trying to see others and acknowledge and to create debate and discussion versus blaming the individual. You know, how do we create the opportunity to solve the problem versus to blame someone for the problem? You know, we all have to take accountability for how we contributed to the situation, but that's a side conversation and it's figuring out how to work differently going forward. And sometimes with groups, you have to, a team, you have to do what's called a post-mortem. We have to talk about what worked and what didn't work. You know, when I work with groups, I ask them that, do you take time at the end of every meeting just to talk about what worked and what didn't work to think about how we're going to shift slightly and take that more curious mindset of how we have to tweak our behavior going forward? You know, as I said, you know, we want to create a safe place because if we don't create a safe place, we shift from connection to protection. And when we go into protection mode, we do it because we don't want to look foolish or incompetent or intrusive or come across as being negative. And as a result, we stop asking questions, offering ideas, critiquing ideas, and we need to do exact, the exact opposite. We need to be asking more questions and critiquing more ideas in order to stretch and challenge our thinking. Um, I just like this visual because it's a nice, I, you know, print it out, put it up somewhere, remind yourself, am I taking a learner's path or a judger's path? Am I trying to learn from the situation or am I trying to blame someone for the situation? And so we have to think about what questions we can ask. And the, this is taken from a book. It's like, change your questions, change your life. And it's true. You know, ask a question differently and it will change the outcome. But it goes back to the core that if you want your team interactions to change, engage in more question asking. Again, it's not just about efficiency and status updates. It's about effectiveness and engaging everyone. Which gets us to number five, the last one of how do we, you know, have these small wins. It's to shift your script. You know, we have to think about that Life isn't always going to be good. We're going to get bad news sometimes. There's going to be mistakes. There's stressful work situations. Personal issues come up and we just have to figure out how to deal with it, okay? And I say that we, what are we going to do about it when things aren't working? We don't want to kill the messenger. We want to solve the problem. Be hard on the process, soft on the person. But turn it around and try and ask. How could we become a better team because of this experience? Okay. So we don't want to avoid having the conversations where we don't talk about problems. We have to embrace the bad on the journey to good. Okay. And that means hearing what's wrong. You know, it was interesting. I worked for Arthur Anderson a long time ago. That would be like Accenture today. 
And part of the reason they imploded as a company is that they couldn't give negative feedback up the food chain in the organization. The CEO never wanted to hear what was wrong. They set goals and you were just expected to meet those goals and expectations. The reality is there's usually some bad news along the way. The environment changes, priorities for group members change, and we have to be able to put those issues on the table and talk about it, about them. You know, pretending that they don't exist is like the elephant in the room. You know, if we're not willing to put problems on the table ourselves, why do we think anybody else is going to? So are you willing to take the risk and put these problems on the, ta on the table or to share difficult information with your team members? And again, use some personal stories, share stories of how, you know, you've worked through this problem in the past, even like with COVID, a lot of times, you know, COVID, we all think, oh, it's been a horrible thing. But if I asked you right now to think of something positive that's come out of COVID, you probably could think of something. And we've all been in those difficult situations where something good came out of something bad and we can talk about that. Okay. Part of what we want to do is reframe the anger that sometimes is part of a difficult situation, which ties directly into where we're going, expressing emotions without being emotional. But instead of we want to reframe any anger we have to maybe shared sadness. You know, I'm not angry at you because we have to negotiate and debate resources. I'm sad that we've been put in this position to have to work through this. Okay. Because it's not always the other person's fault. It's many times the situation. So that is the segue to those are the five things I would suggest very quickly, small acts, big wins. But part of it is expressing emotions without getting emotional. I said it before, emotions are contagious. And, um, you know, we don't go into work. Usually we can't all be happy all the time. You know, we all have a bad day. And it, it used to be the joke because I used to have a Tasmanian devil when I worked in an office one time. And, you know, if I was in a bad mood, I'd kind of stomp in and hang my Tasmanian devil from the door. And people who, you know, it's like, oh, stay away from Nan today. She's in a bad mood. But the people who really knew me and could be honest, people who cared enough, who'd built those connections, they could come in and they knew what they had to do to get me past that mood. Okay. Do we have that same personal awareness with all of our team members that even if they're not in a good mood, can we help them at least work through it on and you know work through it at some level? The thing we have to always remember, though, is there's a space between what we want to say and do, that's our reaction and what we can choose to do, which is our response. And, you know, strong negative emotions don't have to include raising our voices, slamming doors, you know, venting. That's unskilled expression of suppressed negative emotions. And that can be extremely harmful. We need to figure out how to keep a cool head so that we can respond respectfully. And there's four phases to doing that. And the first one is just to calm yourself. And part of that is just knowing that you are starting to feel emotional and know that it's okay to experience those feelings and emotions. Professional gamblers get coaches to work through this because they work with something called tilt, that they want to manage their emotions more effectively because they want to be able to enhance their thinking because in turn, they know that enhances their winnings. So they need to be able to acknowledge the emotion. They've learned they have to breathe through the emotion. Oftentimes they have to change their environment, leave the gambling table, leave the room. We've all been in situations where we've had to do that. Um, and sometimes it's developing a mantra. Like I've got one that sometimes I'll say just because life isn't fair doesn't mean I can't be fair. When I'm frustrated with someone or a situation, it's like I have to remind myself of this. It's like a little ticker tape going through my head to remind me to behave differently. The second then is we have to focus ourselves. You know, research has proven that we can't control every situation. Even when we make good decisions, bad things can happen sometimes. Sometimes we make bad decisions and we get lucky. It just works out. But simply acknowledging that life is unpredictable, uncontrollable, has a physical reaction and changes our subconscious and helps us focus. You know, we have to be present, be here, be prepared to be nowhere else. The third thing is to check your interpretations, you know, of the event. 
I'll be straight up honest. My former husband, sometimes when he'd have a disagreement, um, he'd say to me, it's like, do you stay up at night trying to think of ways to irritate me? It'd be like, well, no, I can just do that naturally. But do you think we were actually ever going to be able to focus on the problem as a partnership when they were focused on the, their interpretation of the intent was that I was trying to create the problem. It had nothing to do with the problem at hand. And so what are our intentions or interpretations of the situation? And we have to decide how we want to respond because then that shapes how we express ourselves. So we have to learn how to acknowledge and express our feelings using more constructive terminology. And it's okay at work to say, I think, I feel, I believe, I'm concerned, I'm anxious. But be prepared to explain more. What goes with that? You know, and clarify your need. And then sometimes don't forget to ask questions to gain the other person's perspective. And this is a skill, learning to express yourself in what I refer to as a supportive manner is a lifelong skill that takes time to build. But rather than saying, you know, someone's idea, you know, really that's never going to work. You can make the comment, I'm concerned about this, um, this new part of the project. You know, we haven't had time to research it the way we typically do. How do we make sure safety is going to be addressed? Oftentimes posing a question, it goes back to that asking questions, will engage others to think more deeply. Okay. It's building on the ideas that somebody had and finding the end. That's an interesting idea. And what about this? Asking a question. The fourth part of managing your emotions is to stretch yourself. We have to step away after the fact when we've been in a difficult situation. Hopefully we've managed it effectively, but if we did get emotional, we need to step back and analyze our emotions. Do you keep a notebook? you know, where you keep track of what your triggers are, you know, sometimes I'll send myself text messages. It's like, Ooh, that irritated me. Why is that irritating me? What's the story I'm telling myself? What's going on in my head? How does this relate to something else is that happened in my life? And we have to unpack our reactions to certain situations. We can also be observant of other people. What do they do? What do they say? We also need to do check-ins, you know, have we figured out how to create a space? You know, once we get more comfortable using emotions and feelings, do we ask people, do we encourage and allow our team members to bring it to work? Do we have five minutes at the beginning of meetings where we say on a scale of one to five, how present are you? Okay. And if someone's not a five, are you willing to say, so what's on your mind? What's distracting you today? And you know, they're going to take you down that path of emotions, potentially. Okay. The last one is develop your language around emotions. You know, one of the activities I love to do with groups is to say, right now, one minute, brainstorm as many emotions as you can. Okay. One minute. And we're not going to do it now, but after we're done, set a timer and do it. And I have never had anybody come up with more than 22 emotions. Typically, it's somewhere between 5 and 12 is the average, maybe 15 to 18. Here's the deal. If we don't have many words in our vocabulary to describe our emotions, we're not going to be able to paraphrase feelings in others. And if we can't describe our emotions, if we don't, if we don't know the difference between irritated and angry, it's going to be harder for us to articulate our own feelings to other people, which can mess up the messages with our team members. And so we have to stretch our language around emotions. Now, I love this visual we're getting at the end. Basically, you know, a lot of times people will ask me, it's like, well, Nan, if we're focused on psychological safety, we're not going to get any work done. And my comment to that is that the apathy zone is like you're in a car and you've got your foot on the brake and you're pushing the button to start the car, but you're not going anywhere. You know, on the comfort zone, you have your foot on the brake, but you haven't put the car into gear and you haven't put gas on the pedal. You're not going too far. You know, you feel psychological safety, but there's no commitment to excellence and moving forward. Most people live in the anxiety zone where people have got their foot on the gas, setting expectations, pushing people, but we have the break on and the break is the psychological safety. It's the anxiety zone where people can't bring themselves fully to the table. 
We want to hit that learning zone where we can really have high psychological safety and push people to achieve high goals by being honest from the start when we see potential problems to stretch our thinking, to challenge ideas, that the learning zone is where we want to go. And that's the value of psychological safety. So who wouldn't want to be on a team where we can show up and really be ourselves and know that it's okay to think differently than everyone else? Rarely is there a right answer to anything out there. The goal is to have collective voices and processes so you can create energy and success. It's not just about immediate results. It's about building your team and their connection. So with that, I'd love to have you at one of my future CCAP courses. Um, the dates are here. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you. Since there wasn't time for a lot of Q&A and we, didn't be, we weren't able to open the chat because there were so many, many people, feel free to send me an email. I say this truly, I'm interested in your questions and your perspectives. Having said that, Lisa, do we have time for one question? Um, yes, we do have time for, I'll say two. The first one is uh, really quick. Um, <laughs> so can you remind us what the G stands for in the PPG model you utilize to provide uh, feedback? Ah, I like that one. Praise, possibility, and gap. And so only once you've talked about the potential of the idea, then can you go into what what might be the shortfalls or the issues with the idea they've shared because it acknowledges that you've really listened and heard the good before you get to that gap or the criticism. Okay, great. Yeah. I was sitting there like, ah, I cannot remember <laughs> what it was. Um, so the second question is how do you move forward if the connection with colleagues is lost after a challenging work dynamic issue, especially when trust has been broken? You know, and that's, this is a really difficult one because it's going to take time. You know, when trust has been broken with an individual, it's going to require you being vulnerable and just having that conversation. Our relationship has changed and that makes me uncomfortable. I value the relationship we used to have, and I'd like to find a time to talk about it. And so it's actually having to put the issue on the table and asking to create some space to do it. But when you do that, find a time and a place that makes the other person also feel safe and comfortable. But it's going to take time. It's not something that necessarily one conversation is going to fix. It may take multiple conversations to unpack. But being the person who's vulnerable and starting the conversation and maybe asking some questions after you've shared your opinion or your feelings or your desires for the relationship is the best place to start. Yeah, thank you so much, Nan. Um, there are more amazing questions. I also want to thank the participants for being uh, so engaged and including tips and, and tricks in the chat. Um, it was really great to see. Um, Again, I'd encourage you as well, if you do have uh, more questions or if your question wasn't asked to reach out to Nan at the information above. So again, thank you so much, Nan, for your time and your incredible, incredibly useful information. Um, it's really been a pleasure having you here. Um, would you be able to share the last slide of the presentation? Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending a link to the webinar recording as well as the slides um, following today's webinar. Um, please take a moment to let us know what you thought about this webinar by clicking on the survey link in the description portion of the YouTube video. The survey is brief and your response will really help us shape future webinar experiences. If you did enjoy this webinar and you'd like to continue engaging in similar topics, please register for our upcoming webinar, Mindsets and the Power of Perspectives. Uh, that webinar is part of our current webinar series, which is Avoiding Burnout at Work. My contact information is also listed on this slide if you'd like to learn more. Again, thank you all so much for joining us today, and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Take care, stay safe, and be well.